What is going on, everybody? It's the Frost, and we're here for a SmackDown Live review for ju- for <clears throat> Friday, the four- uh, August 14th, 2020. We are on our way to SummerSlam. SummerSlam will be here next Sunday. From the Amway Center in Orlando, Florida, this is the last episode of SmackDown coming to you from a taped setting inside the Performance Center. We had more bullshit nonsense from Retribution. The Fiend and Bray Wyatt, the Fiend and Braun Strowman have their thing going on. Alexa Bliss is in between that. What's going on with her? A tri brand battle royal to see who will face us. Um, I'm sorry, Bailey at at SummerSlam. Which, by the way, apparently the next week, which of course is going to be Payback, Bailey and Sasha Banks have to defend those Smack the WWE Tag Team Titles. The next week, and we don't know who that's going to be. Hopefully, we'll find out soon. The fact that WWE is doing a pay per view the next week is still kind of stupid. But we open the show with a video package of what Retribution has been doing lately, which has all been childish, stupid nonsense. We go to the Performance Center. Michael Cole welcomes us and he joins my Corey Graves. Cole says WWE has taken precautions for Retribution tonight. We see how extra security has been hired to guard the entrances. They also hype tonight's lineup, and we go to Big E versus John Morrison. Now, two weeks ago, Kofi Kingston and Big E were in the back. Kofi told Big E that I'm going to be out for a while. Woods is out right now. You get to go and have a singles run. We're going to give you a chance to go out there and shine and show people what you can do because people have forgotten that you are a former NXT champion and a former Intercontinental champion. And what did they do? Last week, we get The Miz. This week, he gets John Morrison. What the fuck? You want to get this guy some kind of singles push? Why are you tying him down to Miz and Morrison still? Like, you said that you had Kofi come out doing this and say that he's going to be out for a couple weeks. Like, six weeks. This is week number three. This is week number three. What are they going to do... In what are they going to do for Big E long enough that when Kofi does come back, apparently in six weeks, that hey, he's had a singles run. What are they going to do that makes you go that this guy is going to be the guy that we needed to like give this guy a shot to be anywhere near a, a, content, a contendership? Honestly, I don't see any of that coming. I just don't. This just doesn't, it just feels like it's just so. So bad how bad they're doing this. But we get Biggie and John Morrison, or we're supposed to. Biggie and John Morrison are both into the ring. The lights start flickering. And a masked female, you can tell it's a female wrestler, comes in, appears to be on the she appears on the apron. Biggie and Morrison stop and look at her. She enters the ring to face off with Biggie and Morrison. Then more masked men and women appear. Colin Graves hightailed out of there. So the men come in, and a couple of women, and they start beating the brakes off of Biggie and Morris. And I'm thinking, where is everybody? Where is the rest of the WWE locker room, the SmackDown locker room? Where is Lucha House Party? Where is um, Corbin? Where is Jeff Hardy? Where is Sheamus? Where is the women? Where is everybody? So these two guys get their asses beat. And then for whatever reason... They lay out Big E, they do destroy his knee. They, they chop block Big E, get his knee destroyed. And they're in the ring, they're going, they're, they're, they're yelling and screaming like they did last week, and then they leave. Why? Why do they need to leave? I mean, there's a ton of you. There's at least six or seven, like six or seven people this time. And you're just leaving because you can? What? Why? You have the high ground. You even have the, um, you have the ring. You have everything. You have weapons. Why are you leaving? This looked really stupid and really, really bad. So, they leave. We go to commercial. We come back. Back and by the way, the, like, and this is the fucked up thing. They leave. The entire retribution or whoever these some um, children are, they leave. And we don't see the entire SmackDown locker room coming down to um, to s- chase them off. We see The Miz. 
So it looks like, and it just looks like from the um, opticals of this is that this group was scared of the Miz. The Miz chased them away, which they both they they um, take this so badly or cut this so badly because. It's like they leave, and the next thing you know, you see the Miz coming down. So it's like, is, are we supposed to believe that these guys are afraid of him, or they're trying to like make it seem like maybe the Miz is the um, leader of Retribution, which would be fucking awful? Back from break, we see a group of superstars in the back. The Miz and Morrison apologize for not, or Miz apologizes to Morrison for not being there, noting he was on a call with Maurice. Morrison blames everything on Biggie, who sent, who was sending tweets and talking trash on Retribution over the weekend. Or during the week. Corbin comes in and he says, we are under attack. No one wants to listen. He says, we are under attack. We need leadership. Looks at his staff and looks at his little, um, little um, scepter and says, well, I'm the guy for the job. If everyone follows me, I can lead them to safety. He goes on and Biggie tells him to shut his mouth. This is our house and I'm not going to, I'll be damned if I'm going to let the Foot Clan from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles run up here and put their feet on the couch, on my couch. Really? That's Foot Clan from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? The Foot Clan from the Teen, that's disrespecting the Foot Clan, sorry. The Foot Clan would not be sitting there chop blocking your leg down and then just like cheer, like raising their hands, screaming and then running away like scared little children when the Miz comes coming. This whole entire retribution thing is definitely a joke. Let's see. So far, we've seen them attack and rip up. I'm sorry. They threw Molotov cocktails at a generator. They beat up. They beat up a bunch of performance center talent out inside the performance center. Spray paint the plexiglass. Spray painted some of the tie. The um, what is those um, the curtains on the apron. They threw bricks, threw two bricks, threw, threw cinder blocks, through the same broken window after breaking it with the first one. Jumping around on around an overturned car, which we didn't even see who it um whose car it was. We didn't see how it was flipped over. Like you're gonna make me, you're gonna want me to believe that four individuals who are smaller. Then uh, the same size of like Kalisto or Grand Metal League or any of the Lucha House Party members are, are powerful enough together to flip over an actual car. Give me a break. And then they come here. They beat the hell out of Biggie. They 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 they're like they're like school bullies. They come in. They beat the hell out of two men. Two like they they outnumber their prey. And they beat them up, and then they leave before anybody else could come in. The worst part is, you had it be. It was only the Miz. Jeff wasn't there. Baron Corbin didn't come down. Sheamus, Chad Gable, Matt Riddle, everybody else were not there. Where was everybody else at this time? That was absolutely just like if it would have been one thing if they would have like laid the entire locker room out or something. Yeah, that would have been great. Would have made him look better. Like, I know people are comparing this to the Nexus, but the Nexus didn't have to hide their face. They attacked two of the top stars in the company at the time, laying them out, destroying the commentary group, choking out Justin Roberts, which we don't really need to talk about it anymore. They left, they, they had an impact. This is doing nothing but looking worse and worse every week. Well, every day, I should say. It's only been like two weeks. So, Biggie goes on and gets everyone hyped up. He says he will go back to the ring tonight and beat Morris and show Retribution how it's done. Says, now now's not the time to run and hide. It's time to fight. He asks who is with him, and most everyone seems to be. Seamus walks in and mocks Biggie. Seamus goes on and taunts Shorty, um, Chad Gable. Seamus isn't afraid of Retribution, but if they had any sense at all, they'd be afraid. Biggie isn't backing down, but he leaves, and some of the others follow. Seamus, Corbin, and Few look on. So, we go back to the arena. We see extra security cards standing around because of what just happened, which, yeah, real top-notch. Like, this is the thing. We have been watching wrestling as a whole. Probably most of us. I've been watching wrestling for about almost for 23 years, something like that. And the security guards that I see, you know, they have black pants. They have, like, dark pants, black shirt, 
black shoes probably on. The the guy, the men and women who get tossed around by the wrestlers. So how am I supposed to believe that these these guys, men and women, are going to do any better against retribution? They seem to not be doing the job because they showed us, hey, here's all these security guards guarding the performance center, and somehow Retribution still got in the building. Somebody's not doing their job, and it's just pathetic. Tribe man, brand Battle Royal, we had Bailey and Sasha Banks come out. They said Retribution actually wants to hear what they have to say, and everyone else should too. Banks says everyone knows that not to interrupt them. Banks sa- Bailey says it's time to get this... Show going with the Pride Brand Battle Royal. They keep ranting on the mic, and now it's time for the Battle Royal. They kick off, kick Hamilton out of the ring, and they do the jo- his job. They introduce... Um, let me think if I can find him right here. They introduce the Moronics. And who else did they get from SmackDown? Let's see. They went with... Um, who did they go for SmackDown? They had... Oh, yeah. Lacey Evans. Then they went from NXT, Shotzi Blackheart... And Tegan Knox. That's it. Try brand title um turn um battle royal. And the full the full list is here is Tamina Snuka, Tegan Knox, Shotzi Blackheart, Ruby Riot, Liv Morgan, Shannon Baszler, Bianca Belair, Tayton Royce, Billy Kay, Naomi, Lacey Evans, Dana Brooke, Nikki Cross. And why they we didn't get to hear everyone else get their introduction is because Oscar is also in this battle royal, and I'm thinking. Why is Asuka getting a chance to maybe go to SummerSlam and have two title matches? Why? Now, who do you think won this match? Do you think it was Shotzi? Do you think it was Tegan? Do you think maybe it was Shayna Baszler? Or do you think WWE is going to do predictable and have Asuka win the Battle Royal? Go on to face both Bayley and Sasha Banks for both championships. This match was actually pretty fast. Like we went, we came back from break, and it was just like elimination happening. It seemed like every few seconds. But now, Shotzi was in there for a bit. She got some to work in. The final four were Shayna Baszler, Oscar, Dana Brooke, and Tegan Knox. Now I'd have to give it to WWE that they they put they showed you that they have some stock to build up Tegan Knox because. Where was Dakota Kai? Where was Rhea Ripley? Where was uh, Mercedes Martinez? Where was Aaliyah? Where was the NXT Women's Champion Io Shirai? Where were all of these women for this tri-brand battle royal? You had two women from NXT. And the one who looked the best out of the ones from NXT was Tegan Knox. She made the Final Four. She went toe-to-toe with both Shayna Baszler and... Um, and, um, Asuka. She even, I believe, got an an elimination, too, or one or two, one elimination or two. But in the end, she got eliminated by Dana Brooke as she was off, like, Dana Brooke was under, was on the floor. Knox was on the outside. She got pulled down by Dana Brooke, which a lot of outside, and this wouldn't make no sense to me. Usually when you see a battle royal happen, maybe at the Royal Rumble, you'll see a rival, like, say... Nikki Cross and Bailey, if Bailey wasn't champion, and Nikki Cross eliminated Bailey, and then Nikki Cross was on the apron. Bailey runs over and pulls her down, eliminating her. We saw that at least four or five times in this match. Liv Morgan got eliminated by the Moronics because she eliminated, with the help of Tegan Knox, both women, and then they pulled her down. You had Dana Brooke. Getting um pulling down Tegan Knox, even though she wasn't eliminated. I, I mean, Dana Brooke wasn't eliminated. But a lot of the pull down to the apron eliminations in this match. Then Dana Brooke goes for a handspring, gets into the Carafuda clutch, and she's gone. Well, Oscar hits a hip attack and eliminates Brooke. Oscar and Shanna Baszler are left. Oscar was. On, ended up on the apron. Bailey looks to pull her down, and that doesn't happen. So she gets kicked away. Ba- Sasha Banks gets kicked away. Like tries to come over and do something, but Oscar gets her off. She does a running slide shot to both of them, or a, run- a running like kick to both of them, knocking them down. Basler comes over, knees her in the face. 
Looks like it's going to be it for Asuka, but she lands on Bailey and Sasha Banks, who are just conveniently laying in the drop zone. So she gets back up there, uh, back on the apron. Instead of rolling into the ring, she gets back on the apron. Shayna gets her into the chaos for the clutch. Looks like we might have a winner here. And then Oscar fights her, pulls her over the apron, and dumps Baszler to the floor. So twice this year, Shayna Baszler was in a battle royal of sorts, having her opponent in a Carafuda clutch, if I'm correct, this is how that went. Oh, no, she did have Scarlett, but no. She's the final and the final eliminated in both the Royal Rumble and this battle royal right here. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride, Sh um, Shanna Baszler. So Asuka has not one, but two title matches at, at SummerSlam. Why? The only thing that I can think of is that it's either A, she's winning both titles... And Bailey and Sasha Banks are going to lose them and then go to payback and lose the tag team titles. Or B, she's only winning one of the titles and most likely the Raw Women's Championship, which makes this entire feud between them absolutely pointless. I just don't see any other reason to do this. Some people are suggesting instead of having a two title matches, make it a triple threat match, have the um, winner merge the championships and end it there. My biggest question for this is who does this how does this build anybody else? Tegan Knox, like I said, did get a little bit of shine in this match because she was a part of the Final Four. She's a member of NXT. She should have been eliminated earlier if they wanted to not build and like give her a little bit of stock. Wasn't too much, but it was something. Shannon Baszler, like I said, always a bridesmaid, bridesmaid never the bride. She had Oscar beat, but Oscar Pulls her over and drops her onto the floor. And this is twice this year that WWE has teased us with Oscar and Shayna Baszler. The first, in, in a match, the first time was at the Elimination Chamber and Oscar got herself destroyed. This time, Shayna Baszler got outsmarted, I guess. So that match has got to be at Payback or somewhere else if Oscar wins. One of these championships. Most likely the Raw Women's Championship. So what are they going to do. With this woman. I don't have a clue. So. Banks and Bailey are both going to be taking on. Sasha, on Oscar. I don't know where they're going to go with this from there. Now back from break. We see Oscar, um, Sasha and Banks and Bailey backstage. She, Bailey isn't happy about Oscar owning the right to face her at SummerSlam. They calm down, and, Oscar, and um, Bailey remind, is reminded that she lost on Monday. But Banks is like, "You could still, you could beat her, you could destroy her." And Bailey puts out the good point that my title wasn't on the line, so at least I'll have something like I'll have something I care about to fight for. She starts to walk. Banks just stops for some reason, and then Oscar comes from out of nowhere, beats up on Bailey, takes her down. Sasha comes over, Asuka beats her down as well, and leaving both women lying. So Asuka made the Women's Tag Team Champions and Raw and SmackDown Champions look like geeks. Way to make you a women, the four, the, like people are dubbing them, the two women power trip, look like losers right there. So... Cole leads us to a Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville feud. Rose is backstage now. She's cut an intense promo about how she's a hard worker despite everything against her. She thinks because she's... She mentions how Sonya talks about how all these things that she says about her being fake, being a Barbie doll, being um, disingenuous, being all this negativity she heard from Sonya Deville. She reminds her that she's never... She's not the first person to do that. She's heard this... Her entire life. And she said, oh, like you, of all people, should know what I had to do to get to the WWE. Yes, I'm a bikini champion, but how's me working three jobs, putting myself through college while getting that bikini, mo that, that championship, not hard work. And then she does what we've all been expecting. A hair versus hair match at SummerSlam. She tells the villain to put her money where her mouth is and says she can't wait to prove the villain wrong and promises things are going to get ugly. So it's going to happen. The villain does later in the show accept this. Calls her baldy, so, you know, 
Do you think Sonya Deville is winning this match? Absolutely not. This just feels like this is going to be one of those matches that Sonya Deville is going to lose to because you don't want to really go. I, I don't know. Because the heel thing would do is you have the heel lose. They get bald. This is something. This is like Victoria versus Molly Holly. When Victoria won a mat, won the match, which I think it was the title match. And if Molly lost, she lost her hair, and she did. And then Molly Holly would come out for the next few months or so, wearing a wig strapped to her neck, like like chin strapped to her. I could see Sonya Deville because it's it's not. Not the babyface thing to do to have the babyface get their head shaved bald. Now, if it's something the babyface wants to do, then yes, that makes sense. Like when Jay Lethal got his hair shaved by, I believe it was Adam Cole, he wanted his hair to be shaved because it was starting to, it was starting to come out anyway. He was starting to lose his hair because of him always wearing it braided. So that one made sense. This one, it feels like you're gonna have Sonya Deville lose. So she's coming out for like the next few months or so wearing a ball, a wig strapped to her head to hide her shame. It just feels like that's the way you want to go with this. But we'll have to wait and I'll have my predictions for that next week. Shame is supposed to um, approach some security guard. He tells them to clock out and enjoy the rest of the few pints because Retribution won't be showing up in, on his watch. They leave. Seamus looks on. Back to commercial break. Back from break and we see Nikki Cross pass. Po- um, Pacing backstage, not happy that she lost another opportunity for the woman's title. When she sees Alexa, gets all happy and everything, runs over and hugs her and apologizes for pushing her down two weeks in a ago and everything else. She asks what's been going on, but Bliss says she's fine. Cross wants to get Bliss to safety because of the fiend, but Bliss says she wants to stay around here and get some answers from the Universal Champion. Braun Strowman, she walks off and Nikki looks confused. Now, I know there's some people out there who want to see the old, dastardly, evil, manipulative um, Alexa Bliss back. And as we know, The Fiend has been one of those guys. The whole thing is, the, the whole motto of The Fiend is, once you mess with the, once the Fiend messes with you, you change. Daniel Bryan, The Miz, Finn Balor, Seth Rollins, Braun Strowman, as we'll talk about here in a bit. Yes, they have all changed because of The Fiend. So, what is going to happen with Alexa Bliss? Her attitude was different. She seemed like she didn't want to, um, she didn't want to, you know, be all friendly and everything like she's been for like the last few, like since she's been friends with Nikki Cross and did this whole friendship thing. It's just, um, I don't know what they're going to do. And, and obviously, we'll talk about more about it in a bit. So, I'm going to have to just, we'll just have to see what happens. So, Alexa Bliss is going to be here more than likely. I just, I just, I don't know. So, yes, that is Alexa Bliss. We will hear from her in a bit. But well, we go back to commercial break, and we come back, and it's Sheamus versus Chad Gable. After what happened last week, Matt Riddle and Sheamus were having a match, and Chad Gable came down and attacked Matt Riddle, causing a DQ. Sheamus destroyed him with two bro kicks. So, this week, it's going to be a match between these two. Chad Gable comes out with new music. He's got new music, different attitude, comes down, and loses. Same ugly attire, same ugly um, logo, new music, new attitude, same losing ways. Sheamus beats him in about two minutes. Match was really nothing special. Sheamus hits a bro kick. One, two, three. After the match, Sheamus puts in the ring, yada, yada, and an Intercontinental Champion, AJ Styles, is seen back yelling at, get this, Joseph Park. If you don't know who Joseph Park is, you did not watch Impact Wrestling from like 2012, 2010, I think it was, 2011 I think it actually was, to 2014, 15. Joseph Park is abyss, unmasked, but he's playing his brother. I think it was, I think it was 2011, I could be totally wrong, but there was a time where, Bit, where abyss was on TNA Impact TV, was kidnapped by people. 
and he disappeared. He was gone forever. I think he actually had I think he had some kind of injury that he was recovering for. So Impact Wrestling, I don't know who came up with this, but this was one of the best things I've ever seen them do. We see this guy come out, come to the back, and he's like, I'm looking for my brother, Chris, you know, Abyss. And it's Joseph. He's calling himself Joseph Park. And obviously, it's Abyss, which he's obviously wearing some kind of, like, teeth guard because Abyss lost his front teeth. And this dude comes out, and Abyss is a really good wrestler. Abyss, Abyss Chris Park is his real name, is a good wrestler. He can go in there, and he's also a really good fucking actor because he made Joseph Park in Impact Wrestling work. It's, it's really easy to... Go out there, and if you train enough, you could be a good professional wrestler, and you could be one of the best. It takes a whole nother level to go out there, being a great professional wrestler, and doing everything you can to look like you don't know what the fuck you're doing. This is how, that's how good Chris is, a.k.a. Abyss, a.k.a. Joseph Park. So, Joseph is back there with, with AJ Styles. They're talking about something. AJ is pushing, pointing at the screen Joseph's looking at. AJ says something on the screen. Grace says AJ Styles is tired of t- facing challenges who aren't worthy. So he's going. So tonight we get to see the debut of the phenomenal Intercontinental Statistic System, also known as PISS. P I S S. Oh, good grief. This, that, that's just, that's just, that's just whatever. Back for break and out comes AJ Styles with Joseph Park. But, and, and no, it is a new character. It is not a new character if anyone thinks. He actually says, AJ Styles actually asks for like a marker later and says Joseph Park. So it is still Joseph Park, just not, I, I don't know. I guess um, his time at Park, Park and Park has been over. AJ has a lot going on in WWE right now, and so then nobody cares about these hooligans trying to tear up stuff up. He says we have more pressing things to worry about, like who will he face at SummerSlam. He goes on about being a fighting champion and has, and how nerds keep telling him about the, who he should defend against. Based on statistics, AJ Styles says he's dawned on him when he was watching baseball. He's looking at batter averages. He when he when he's watching football, he's thought, he's looking at these stats and everything, and he. A lot of people do don't don't realize that they look at statistics every single week, but yes, that's what he's like. Yeah, okay. So, um, I'm a handsome stud. He says of a nerd himself because he cares about statistics. He says it is an easy. It, it's as easy as this. If you're going to be go by statistics, st- 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 um, I'm sorry, statistics. Then he's hired a team of co- uh, to come up with the phenomenal intercontinental statistics system or PISS, aka PISS. And then he thinks about it for a second. He's like, well, that didn't come out, right? So, yeah, it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. Yeah, right. You're just taking a piss out of everything all the time. And he just says this doesn't mean he just handed out title shots. He doesn't hand out anything. You will earn this. He pulls off the top part of the easel, covering up the whiteboard, shows that he is the number one spot. Then he says, who's number two, three, four, and five? Shows us who else is on the chart, but there is no one else. The crowd boos. AJ says no one else has earned the right to be in the ring with him. But here's the truth. If you work hard, really, 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 really hard, and he doesn't like a big baby voice, really, really, really hard, something like that, and you will face him to the title shot, and out comes Jeff Hardy. This has been rumored that Jeff Hardy will be taking on AJ Styles at SummerSlam. We will talk about what WWE is actually going to be doing instead. AJ mentions, the, I'm sorry, Hardy mentions the respect that he has for AJ in his career. He also talks about how Sheamus robbed him in the Intercontinental title tournament and how special the Asking title is for him because it's the first championship he won on his own, beating, and I wish he would mention this, beating Triple H. AJ admits that AJ Styles was a Hardy sounds mega cool. A mega cool champ breaks out. Hardy says he's... Out here, man the man to ask AJ for a shot at the title. AJ says, statistics aside, he respects Jeff. 
and always has. They've known each other for a long time, and Jeff has always been good to him. He admires what Jeff has been through and where he's coming from. Says a lot of people would love to see them in the ring together, and goes on giving Jeff props and says he deserves to be on that board. He says, now, on top, now, after all that, do will we see Jeff Hardy versus AJ Styles? Hell no, we won't. He says, if you really want to earn a title shot, you need to earn it. This isn't some pity party. Jeff beats him, attacks AJ, beats him down, hits Joseph Park, who just falls backwards and rolls out of the ring, which, again... Just Chris Park is one of the best fucking actors in all of it of all of wrestling. I'm sorry, no ifs ands or buts about it. This guy should be getting like like if if WWE Studios or any other co- company out there wanted to give this guy an acting job like a job on a movie, the dude has got the chops. He is one of the best act like, character actors I've ever seen. AJ, uh, of course, Jeff grabs the marker, writes his name on it, does a little bit of artistry, and stands tall. Music. His view hits while AJ is laid out on the floor. He scares Joseph away as well. So, the SmackDown Tag Team Champions Cesario and Shinsuke Nakamura backstage. They put the belts on display and they talk some more. The Lucha House Party about them not, not having a chance. Lindsay Dorado and Grant Metalik creep up behind them, snatch the titles, and run away like, um, oh, what the fuck is his name? Anyway, um, the champs go after them and they've heard in the commercial break. Back from break and Kayla Braxton. Stops AJ Styles and assistant Joseph Park. Kayla asks about it. Jeff Hardy. Asks Jay, Jeff asks, AJ says Jeff assaulted him and doesn't respect the title. And he doesn't respect the title or him or analytics. He says if Jeff wants a piece of him, he's going to get it. Says he will show everyone what happens when you mess with him. You get erased. He turns to erase the name of Jeff Hardy off the whiteboard. And he's struggling. And he takes his jacket to try to. And he's like... Permanent marker. Joseph, of course, is like, you know, not happy with himself on this one. And they they right away. They run away. They, they walk away. So, yeah, there is that. It comes out later that in the show that next week on SmackDown, two days before SummerSlam, what is WWE going to do? They're going to have AJ Styles versus Jeff Hardy. Two days before SummerSlam. Why? Are we going to get a fuck finish and go, oh, well, we'll have another SummerSlam. Why is WWE this fucking lazy? They can't come up with something to put on SmackDown that will get people to watch. No, we're going to put Jeff Hardy versus AJ Styles two days before SummerSlam. Are you kidding me? What kind of bullshit is this? That's just lazy booking, lazy booking, lazy booking. Grand Metal League versus Shinsuke Nakamura. Grand Metal League, of course, and them come out. They have they had the titles. This match was nothing special. The only thing that really out of this match that you want to talk about is towards the end of the match. Um, Nakamura is going for the Kinshasa. Out comes the returning Kalisto. Kalisto has been out with a separated shoulder, as Michael Cole noted. He makes his return. Cesaro and Nakamura are surprised. Lindsay Dorado and Kalisto end up double teaming um, Cesaro on the ramp. Kalisto drops him with a ramp with a big DDT. Mental League takes advantage of the ring, connects with a big elbow drop off the top, off the top rope, and gets the pin. Grand Metal League boots Shinsuke Nakamura. Normally, I would complain about somebody getting beat clean. Why are champions getting beat clean? This one is not a clean win for Grand Metalik. No, the other guys didn't go in and like distract him and like go in there and like trip him up or anything, but they did distract him and it led to the victory. So this one I can understand why Nakamura lost. Usually it's the the baby face uh, the, like the the champion gets rolled up or some other bullshit, but no. This one makes sense. And my God, Grant Kalisto, what the fuck have you been doing on your time off? The dude looks jacked. I wish I had a picture to be able to show you if I had the ability to. But this dude looks jacked. Holy shit. So that is definitely going to be your tag team title match going into um, in the SummerSlam. 
Backstage, and Alexa Bliss is getting ready for a sit-down interview. Back from break, we see Matt Riddle in the back. She asked about King. She asked about King um, about Baron Corbin and his ransom and retribution. I don't know why she had to mention retribution. Matt Riddle doesn't even address that. Says a bounty on his head isn't cool, but he came here to compete and he wants to compete. But Corbin walking around calling himself a king, but he's just a royal pain. Says he called Corbin out, tried to fight him, even co- costing him in a match with Sheamus last week. Riddle doesn't know what else to sit, to do. Um, Chad Gable walks up and says he has to explain himself. He has a family to feed and got caught up in the... You make a lot of fucking money working for WWE. I hate this fucking excuse. Oh, I have a family to feed. What the fuck are you doing with your paycheck, man? Seriously. You and everyone else make millions of fucking dollars because of these contracts that WWE have paid you guys. Don't, I, I don't like that fucking like, oh, well, I'm too poor to, no, no, that's no excuse. This is fucking stupid that WWE wants to sit there and do that. Give me a fucking break. Just, I, 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 I just can't even with this company. But that doesn't justify what I did. Trying to injure another superstar is not, is not, is not, is not, is not who I am and I'm embarrassed. I came here to apologize face to face, man to man, and get, extends his hand with the um, for the fist bump. And Riddle says it's all good. He's got he gets it. Says Gable, if Gable ever wants to go and let him wants to go at it, let him know because the bro is up for a fight. And this was obviously a setup because Corbin from behind with the scepter, knocking taking him out. Corbin takes down. The um takes down Riddle. He looks at and Gable doesn't look impressed with the sneak attack. Corbin says, "Thanks, thanks, Chad, for helping me. It's been I knew you were always about something, Chad." But he looks uh, but it looks like Gable wasn't involved. Corbin walks off. Of course, he was involved. It was a whole total fucking setup. Cole sends us to the Alexa Bliss interview. She's being interviewed by an unknown interviewer, some schmo. She talks about how they previously got to know the Universal Champion Braun Strowman. We see clips from their past together from the Super from the Mixed Match Challenge and Table for Three, um, Carpool K, like all these. Uh, what do you call it? The um, the um, Ride Along they do on the WWE Network. He's a good man. He's awesome, funny, witty, pro, um, protective, passionate. They get along so well because they call each other out on their crap. They could be fun with each other and be the best and, and be best friends. She, the interviewer then asks if she thought it would be become more than a friendship, like romantically. She asks. She says, "Yeah." She says, "Maybe because they both cared about each other." He asks if they, if that's why the fiend targeted her. She says she doesn't know. That's a question for the fiend. He then asks her what it be what it's like to be in the fiend's presence. She says it's scary, terrifying, and also compelling. Says once you've interacted with the fiend, it's almost like you can just feel his presence for the first time in her life. She understands why they say a moth to a flame. We see wrong comments from last week where he told the fiend that he doesn't give a damn about Bliss. All he cares about is destroying the fiend because he is the monster. He asked Bliss how that made her feel. She thinks about it. She looks like she's about ready to cry. She literally looks like she's about ready to cry. She has like. She just looks like she's trying to hold back how she really feels, and then she just looks off to the side, and we go to commercial break. Really good, good, good really good, like, um, emotion and storytelling by Alexa Bliss. She is coming in, like, I'm going to say now, she is coming along really well with this, um, this, everything that's going on with her, like, she, like, her character evolving from being the evil bitch that she was for so many years then becoming the um ha- the um happy baby face with nikki cross being a tag team with them being tag team champions i think twice to everything that's going on now and the fiend changing her she feels a little bit different we'll see how this goes will she cost braun Strowman at SummerSlam? we'll continue that on here in a bit like I said earlier, Sonya Deville accepts Mandy Rose's um, challenge for SummerSlam, and then we go into the main event, which was the match we were supposed to have at the beginning of the show. So we have Biggie versus John Morrison. 
Lights flicker a little bit during the beginning of this, like during the um first before the first commercial break. We come back, and everybody and their brother is out there for the show for the for, the, for this match. Then this match continues on, and then we see backstage. Retribution is a, is destroying the locker room, attacking referees, attacking personnel. Like I said earlier, they're like school bullies who stick together. They target people. They target the weak, while the while the strong are gone. And then when the strong big the big buff strong people come to kick their ass, they're nowhere to be found. This just feels like high school garbage. This was. This is just so dumb. So, back from break, like I said, in the end, Miz, I'm not sorry, Miz, but Big E catches Mor- like Morrison's arm, leg over his neck, beats him with the stretch muffler, and gets the win. That's two weeks in a row Big E has won, has won a match with the stretch, stretch muffler. Is he replacing the big ending with the stretch muffler? I wouldn't mind that. So... As he's leaving and celebrating, he turns around, eats a bro kick to the head, and that's and then Seamus goes to pick him up, and then Braun Strowman's music Braun Strowman's music hits. And Seamus disappears, Big E disappears, and I'm just gonna have to play this to give you what I have on Braun Strowman's new look. If you don't know what happened, Braun Strowman made his return to TV tonight, and this tells you everything. Yes, Braun Strowman, the Universal Champion, is bald. He still has his mustache. I mean, not his mustache, but his beard. But the guy came out with no hair on his head. He looked like... Honestly, with the way his, his demeanor was, his look, his look in his eyes was... He looked like Gene Snitsky. I'm gonna be real honest. It looked like Gene Snitsky with a with a long beard. I'm just gonna put that down that way. He calling he's he we come back from break. We come um, we see him. He wants the fiend. He wants to he doesn't want to wait. He wants to beat this guy up. He wants to destroy him. Out comes Alexa Bliss. Alexa Bliss and Braun Strowman is just like standing looking like just dead down at the uh, towards the ca- towards hard came away. Bless comes in, and she just wants she wants to have a conversation with him, and he tells her, "I don't give a damn about you. You used me. You tried to turn me into something I am not. How dare you? You made me sing stupid songs in your car." She's not happy. She's like, "What the hell are you talking about? This isn't the Bronx Doma that I know." And he just tells her to get out of his ring. And she tells him to look at her when he is talk when she is talking to him. Eventually, he does turn to face her. Now I don't know what the fuck this edit was for, but she slaps him the first time, and it sounds like it sounds a lot louder than it should. Then she slaps him another four or five times with both hands, trying to get him to like you know wake up because this is not the fiend that the bronze domain she knows. So he picks her up. In, over his head, looks to pick her up and throw her, but every time he moves around the ring, he the lights go down some more and some more. Then eventually, he just pushes her, shoots her up, and f- she falls to the mat. And then the f- lights come back up. The fiend is there. Braun Strowman is missing, and Alexa Bliss is writhing in pain. So Braun Strowman has got powers now. Braun Strowman can teleport. Braun Strowman ends up on the big screen. He is laughing maniacally, losing his like laughing like a like a crazy psychopath. While the fiend also laughs a little bit, and then the fiend sticks his tongue out. Braun screams, and that is that. SmackDown goes off the air. This is the final SmackDown from the Performance Center. So we've been here since March. SmackDown was actually the first, remember, the first show that WWE had to do strictly from the Performance Center without fans. If you actually want to think about it, NXT the Wednesday beforehand was the first show in the Performance Center, but that one, that show had fans. So we're going to be in the Amway Center. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off my thoughts for how the Amway Center is gonna look until next week. But this show just retribution needs to be done. They need to just end this, nip it in the butt, be done with it. Just be done with it. It's the 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 angle sucks. Like people are like, oh well, it, one, until these people are unmasked, this show this this angle is gonna suck. And I'm thinking, if they unmask and okay, one of the reasons Ace and Eights failed was because, and it failed poorly after everyone after everyone got unmasked. The first person unmasked in that group was Devon. Big shocker because weeks before Devon was revealed his contract with Impact Wrestling TNA roll, um, ran, ran out legitimately and we did not know as fans that he was going to be back. He was in Aces and Ace. Then you had Doc Gallows, Mike Knox, Garrett Bischoff, um, Wes Briscoe, Mr. Anderson joined them, D'Lo Brown of all people. And then of course... Bully Ray. And other than Bully Ray and Devon, who gave a fuck about the other ones? Any good faction, whether it's Devon and Bubba Ray running the faction with a bunch of other guys, should be, be be grooming somebody to be another star. Like, why the Nation of Domination is one of the best factions of all time is because it made The Rock... It made The Godfather, it made D'Lo, and it made Mark Henry for a bit until Mark Henry had some other problems. It made everybody who came out of the Nation of Dominations were better off afterwards. DX, somewhat the same thing, I guess. I mean, the New Age Outlaws didn't need to be in DX. Everyone fucking knows that. China, we're not going to go into that, which just... This group is going to fail unless they have the right guys and girls. I'm telling you right now, if Vanessa Bourne is an actual person in this in this group, that's going to be a mark off on them because Vanessa Bourne as ceiling has uh, she's hit her ceiling in NXT and trying to bring her up. She's not that really really that good. She never was. She's never probably going to be. But having them go out there. I mean, it was one thing to have them beat up on Miz and Mor- uh, on Morrison and Big E. That's a step in the right direction. They need to be terrorizing the group of talent, of superstars. Having them beat up on these two guys, having the ring occupied, having the arena occupied, and then running away before anybody can come down and chase them off makes them look like cowards. Having them go in the back later in the show, beating up on... Referees beating up on no name, no name, like stagehands, and then when the big bat, when the um roster comes to fight them, they're gone. That makes them look like cowards. Is this group supposed to be nothing but cowards? That's what it looks like to me. Ron Strowman, heel, Alexa Bliss. Apparently, like I said, is Alexa Bliss going to screw Braun Strowman again? Because if you think about it, the whole Sister Abigail thing, like with her like dressing up as Sister Abigail, whatever the fuck that was, at the horror show that was Extreme Rules, that led to Braun Strowman losing. Or it was the start of that. Will she cost Braun Strowman and, finally, and take her final place as Sister Abigail? It's going to be very interesting to see what happens when it comes to the Universal Championship and everything. I don't give a shit about Retribution. They have given us no reason to give a shit about Retribution. But I'm going to sit there and call that and say this show was eh. Now, like I said, with the Tri-Brand Battle Royal, they needed to, they should have had more from NXT. Shotzi Blackheart and Tegan Knox are great, but you could have had... Dakota Kai, you could have had Io Shirai, you could have had Rhea Ripley, and so on and so forth, Mercedes Martinez, but they didn't do that. But that is your SmackDown review for, uh, for a- August the 14th, 2020. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video, find me on Twitter at The France Club, find me on Twitch.tv slash The France Club, find me on Instagram at The France Club, and I'll see you guys sun- on Sunday for Unscripted. Until then, my name is The France, and I'll see you guys later.